Now the next sutta is 36, Maha Satchaka Sutta, the greater discourse to Satchaka. Uh, thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Vesali in the great wood, in the hall with the peak roof. Now on that occasion, when it was morning, the Blessed One had finished dressing and had taken his bowl and outer robe, desiring to go into Vesali for arms. Then as Satchaka, the Niganta's son, was walking and wandering for exercise, he came to the hall with the peak roof in the great wood. The Venerable Ananda saw him coming in the distance and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, here comes Sachaka, the Dinganta's son, a debater and a clever speaker regarded by many as a saint. He wants to discredit the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. It would be good if the Blessed One would sit down for a while out of compassion. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready. Then Sachaka, the Dinganta's son, went up to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. Stop here for a moment. So this must be later, after the first debate with the Buddha. Uh, still, Verba uh, Ananda felt uh, that this, this guy uh, is still out to discredit the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Uh, so he asked the Buddha to sit down for a while uh, to engage in talk with this fellow. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Master Gautama, there are some recluses and Brahmins who abide pursuing development of body, but not development of mind. They are touched by bodily painful feeling. In the past, when one was touched by bodily painful feeling, one's thighs would become rigid, one's heart would burst, hot blood would gush from one's mouth, and one would go mad, go out of one's mind. So then the mind was subservient to the body. The body wielded mastery over it. Why is that? Because the mind was not developed. But there are some recluses and Brahmins who abide pursuing development of mind, but not development of body. They are touched by mental painful feeling. In the past, when one was touched by mental painful feeling, one's thighs would become rigid, one's heart would burst, hot blood would gush from one's mouth, and one would go mad, go out of one's mind. So then the body was subservient to the mind. The mind wielded mastery over it. Why is that? Because the body was not developed, Master Gotama. It has occurred to me, surely Master Gotama's disciples abide pursuing development of mind, but not development of body. Stop here for a moment. You see this uh, ignoramus, huh? this uh, Sachaka, he doesn't know what is development of body and what is development of mind. So he assumes huh? that those ascetics uh, who practice uh, ascetic practices uh, and torture their body, uh, they are pursuing development of body. Uh, that's why he says, uh, those who abide pursuing uh, development of body, uh, they are touched by bodily painful feeling. Uh. And then he thinks uh, that those who uh, pursue uh, development of mind, uh, they, uh, in the same way, uh, they torture their mind uh, so that they get mental painful feeling. So he sees that the Buddha and the Buddha's disciples uh, are not practicing all these ascetic practices, uh, the external set ascetics practice. Uh. So he assumes uh, that the body, the, the, the Buddha, uh, the, here he says, uh, the body is not developed. Uh, uh, he says, surely Master Gautama's disciples abide pursuing development of mind, but not development of body. Uh, so because the, the Buddha's disciples don't torture their body, uh, he says the uh, Buddha's disciples are not developing their body, but they seem to be developing their, 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 their mind, they seem to be meditating a lot, uh, and then he thinks uh, by meditating a lot, uh, they're getting a lot of mental pain. Uh. So he, he thinks that the Buddha, his, his disciples are pursuing development of mind only. Then the Buddha said, but Agivesana, what have you learned about development of body? And he said, well, there are, for example, Nanda Vacha, Kisa San Kicha, Makali Gosala. They go naked, rejecting conventions, licking their hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked. They do not accept food brought or food specially made or an invitation to a meal. They receive nothing from a pot, from a bowl, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving sup, from a woman lying with a man, from where food is advertised to be distributed, from where a dog is waiting, 
from where flies are buzzing. They accept no fish or meat. They drink no liquor, wine or fermented brew. They keep to one house, to one morsel. They keep to two houses, to two morsels. Three, four, up to seven houses and seven morsels. They live on one saucerful a day, on two saucerfuls a day. Three, four, up to seven saucerfuls a day. They take food once a day, once every two days, once every three, four, five, up to once every seven days, and so on, up to once every fortnight. They dwell pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, uh, you see this list. Uh, when the Buddha asks him, what do you know about development of body? Uh, he he uh, mentions all these ascetic practices uh, that uh, uh, external sex ascetics practice. Uh, and some of them, you see, uh, like uh, they don't accept uh, uh, fo food from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving some. Uh, uh, from where a dog is waiting, from where flies are buzzing. Uh, this is uh, compassion without wisdom. Uh, because they think uh, if they accept food from a pregnant woman, uh, then the uh, baby in the womb uh, will not have enough to eat. When they accept food from a woman giving suck, uh, then the baby also will not have enough milk to eat. Uh, if they accept food where a dog is waiting, uh, then uh, the dog will not have enough to eat. Uh. So our compassion for the dog. And then when, when flies are buzzing about, uh, they think that if they accept food, uh, the flies also will not have a chance to eat. Uh. Uh, so this is stupid compassion uh, without wisdom. Uh. And then the others, uh, like ascetic practices, uh, uh, they only bake from one house or only bake from two houses. Maximum only seven houses. Uh. Uh, and then uh, they take uh, one source of food or food a day or two or three, uh, etc. And also eating once a day, once every two days, up to once every 14 days. Uh. Uh, but when they eat, uh, they eat as much as they can. Uh. Then after that, they starve for 13 days. After that, they eat again. So, this is what he he, he thinks uh, is development of body. Uh. And then the Buddha said, But do they subsist on so little agivesana? And he said, No, Master Gautama. Sometimes they consume excellent hard food, eat excellent soft food, taste excellent delicacies, drink excellent drinks. Thereby, they again regain their strength fortify themselves and become fat. And the Buddha said, What they earlier abandoned, Agivesana, they later gather together again. That is how there is increase and decrease of this body. But what have you learned about development of mind? When Sachaka, the Niganta's son, was asked by the Blessed One about development of mind, he was unable to answer. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, just now, he... His idea of development of body uh, is to subject it to ascetic practices, uh, painful practices. Uh. But when the Buddha asked him to describe what you mean by development of mind, uh, he had no idea uh, what, what, how to develop the mind. Uh. Then the Blessed One told him, What you have just spoken of as development of body, Agivesana, is not development of body according to the Dhamma in the Noble One's discipline. Since you do not know what development of body is, how could you know what development of mind is? Nevertheless, Agivesana, as to how one is undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, Sachaka, the Dinganta son, replied. The Blessed One said, How, Agivesana, is one undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind? Here, Agivesana, pleasant feeling arises in an untaught, ordinary person. Touched by that pleasant feeling, he lusts after pleasure and, con and continues to lust after pleasure. That pleasant, of, pleasant feeling of his ceases. With the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by that painful feeling, he sorrows, grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. When that pleasant feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because body is not developed. And when that pain, painful feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because mind is not developed. Anyone in whom in this double manner arisen pleasant feeling invades his mind and remains because body is not developed, and arisen painful feeling invades his mind and remains because mind is not developed, is thus undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind. Uh, so here the Buddha says, uh, 
that a person uh, who is undeveloped in body, uh, when pleasant feeling arises, uh, then he lusts after it. Uh, and one undeveloped in mind, uh, when painful feeling arises, uh, uh, it also invades his mind and remains. Uh, and how Agivesana is one developed in body and developed in mind? Here, Agivesana, pleasant feeling arises in a well-taught noble disciple. Touched by that pleasant feeling, he does not lust after pleasure or continue to lust after pleasure. That pleasant feeling of his ceases. With the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by that painful feeling, he does not sorrow, grieve and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast and become distraught. When the pleasant feeling has arisen in him, it does not invade his mind and remain, because body is developed. And when that painful feeling has arisen in him, it does not invade his mind and remain, because mind is developed. Anyone in whom in this double manner arisen pleasant feeling does not invade his mind and remain, because body is developed. And arisen painful feeling does not invade his mind and remain, because mind is developed is thus developed in body and developed in mind. I'll stop here for a moment. So, here developed in, in body is the reverse. Uh, person developed in body, and when pleasant feeling arises, uh, he does not last after it. Uh, and uh, person developed in mind, uh, when painful feeling arises, uh, he does not sorrow, grieve and lament. Uh, he accepts it. Uh, According to the commentary, one developed in body uh, means uh, one who has insight, uh, one who has insight, uh, and one developed in mind uh, man means one uh, who has uh, concentration, jhanas. Uh, they assume uh, when uh, suffering comes, uh, they enter jhana. Uh, but I think these two are uh, developed in body and developed in mind, uh, and refer to an arya. Uh, uh, you see a person with right view, an Arya, he knows uh, uh, the danger of pleasant feeling. Uh. So when any pleasant feeling arises, uh, he knows it is impermanent. Uh, so he does not uh, uh, crave for it. Uh, uh. And then when painful feeling arises, uh, he also accepts it. Uh, and he does not, uh, it does not evade his mind and remain uh, because he does not think uh, there's no proliferation of thoughts, uh, uh, as the Buddha says in the Sutta. An ordinary person uh, has two kinds of suffering, uh, bodily pain and mental pain. Whereas an Arya has only mental, uh, sorry, has only bodily suffering. Uh, an Arya does not have uh, mental uh, suffering because he does not uh, um, think too much uh, about... Uh, uh, about it. Uh, he accepts uh, whatever comes uh, as Kama Vipaka. Uh, mm. And Sachaka said, I have confidence in Master Gotama thus. Master Gotama is developed in body and developed in mind. And the Buddha said, Surely, Yagivesana, your words are offensive and discourteous, but still I will answer you. Since I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and went forth from the home life into homelessness, it has not been possible for arisen pleasant feeling to invade my mind and remain, or for arisen painful feeling to invade my mind and remain. I stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, this 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 Sachaka, uh, he says, uh, I have confidence uh, that Master Gotama is developed in body and developed in mind. Uh. So the Buddha says, uh, your words are offensive uh, and discourteous. Uh. Why? Because uh, he is asking the Buddha to, to say uh, whether the Buddha is developed in body or developed in mind. Uh. And uh, a lay person uh, is not supposed to ask a monk uh, about his attainments. Uh, and a monk is not supposed to speak of his attainments. Uh. Uh, so you should not ask a monk, uh, have, you, have you attained jhana? Uh, if you attain this and attain a sotapanna, all this, uh, it is uh, offensive. Uh, you. So the Buddha says, uh, ever since he went forth, uh, 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 arisen pleasant feelings uh, uh, do not invade his mind, or arisen painful feelings also do not remain, invade his mind and remain. Uh.
and Sachaka asked, Has there never arisen in Master Gautama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade his mind and remain? Has there never arisen in Master Gautama a feeling so painful that it could invade his mind and remain? And the Buddha said, Why not, Agivesana? Hear, Agivesana, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought, how so life is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the home, the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Later, while still young, a black haired young man, endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, etc. Uh, here the Buddha describes uh, uh, exactly what he said in Sutta 26. Uh, and that's page two, five, six. I won't read the whole thing, but uh, I will uh, say basically. Oh. So the Buddha said uh, that um, uh, in front of his parents, he left the home life. Uh, then he went to learn the meditation under uh, Alara Kalama first, uh, but because he did not attain enlightenment, uh, he left him. Uh, but he attained the base of nothingness, the arupa. Then after that, he went to look for another meditation teacher. Uh, that was uh, Udaka Ramaputta. And he was able to attain the, the, the state of meditation that Udaka Ramaputta attained, which is the highest arupa, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. But still, he did not become enlightened. So he left uh, Udaka Ramaputta. Uh, then after that, uh, he went to six years of ascetic practices uh, uh, for which he suffered a lot uh, and became so thin uh, that he nearly died. Then after that, he decided to uh, go on the middle path. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, then he, he found a suitable place to practice uh, by the banks of the river. Uh, near Uruvela. Uh, then, then the Buddha said, Now these three similes occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood lying in water, and a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying in the water? No, Master Gotama, why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood and it is lying in water. Eventually, the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who still do not live bodily and mentally withdrawn from sensual pleasures, and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst, and fever for sensual pleasures and not, has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. This was the first simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. I'll stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, uh, during the Buddha's days, huh, when you want to make fire, huh, you take an upper piece, upper fire stick, huh? it, it's, it's held uh, vertically, huh? and then you get another piece huh, which is put uh, horizontally, and then you rub, rub, rub until huh, uh, heat is generated. Huh? Then they put some fine, um, fine um, wood shavings or anything uh, to start the fire. Uh. But this bottom piece, uh, the, the Buddha says, uh, suppose you use this bottom piece, is wet externally and wet internally. Uh. The whole uh, piece uh, has been lying in water, so it's soaked with water and outside also is wet. Uh. There's no hope uh, of making a fire. Uh. In the same way, if a monk uh, um, is... Uh, uh, bodily and mentally uh, not withdrawn from uh, sensual desire, uh, say, then uh, there's no hope uh, of enlightenment. Uh, bodily uh, withdrawn from sensual pleasures means uh, he does not 
uh, use the body yeah, to engage in sensual pleasures lah. and mentally withdrawn from sensual pleasures also he does not think about sensual pleasures lah. Uh, Again, Agivesana, a second simile occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood lying on dry land, far from water, and a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying on dry land, far from water? No, Master Gotama, why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood, even though it is lying on dry land far from water, eventually the man will reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily and mentally withdrawn from sensual pleasures, but whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasures has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally, even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to assertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to assertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. This was the second simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. I'll stop here for a moment. So here the second piece of wood, uh, that the Buddha says uh, is unable to start a fire uh, is uh, the wood inside is uh, dry because it's been uh, lying on dry land but outside is wet uh, just like a piece of wood uh, suppose uh, on the ground uh, and the rain came last night uh, so it became wet uh, so if you want to make a fire you won't be able to uh. so the Buddha says uh, uh, in the same way uh, there are some monks uh, uh, bodily and mentally they are withdrawn from sensual pleasures la. that means they don't engage in sensual pleasures uh, through the body and they also don't uh, think of uh, sensual uh, pleasures la, uh, using the mind to, to, to daydream and, and fantasize and all these things uh. but the um, this uh, the uh, the sensual desire uh, has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. La. That means uh, deep inside, uh, the, 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 the desire has not been rooted out. Uh, and then uh, again, Agivesana, a third simile occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a dry, sapless piece of wood lying on dry land, far from water, and a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agivesana? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by rubbing it against a dry, sapless piece of wood lying on dry land, far from water? Yes, Master Gotama. Why so? Because it is a dry, sapless piece of wood, and it is lying on dry land, far from water. So too, Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily and mentally withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose desire, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasures has been fully abandoned and suppressed internally, even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to assertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to assertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. This was the third simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. These are the three similes that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So these three similes, uh, the first one uh, is the wood uh, uh, is uh, wet inside and outside. The second one, uh, inside is dry but outside is wet. The third one is dry inside and dry outside. Uh. Uh, only the third one, uh, you can uh, produce fire. So in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, for a person to become enlightened, uh, he has not only to be uh, bodily and mentally withdrawn from sensual pleasures, but the, uh, the sensual desire uh, must be fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Uh, how can you abandon and suppress this uh, sensual desire uh, internally? This you have to look at the hindrances of the 
five hindrances. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, sensual desire. Uh, so, uh, if a person, for example, he understands the Dhamma, he understands the sensual uh, desire is uh, unwholesome, la. it can lead to repeat, repeated rebirth. La. So, having understood the Dhamma, he does not engage in sensual pleasures and he does not want to think about sensual pleasures also. La. But because he has not eliminated uh, this hindrance of sensual uh, uh, desire, uh, which is the first hindrance uh, out of the five hindrances, uh, if he has not eliminated this hindrance, uh, then uh, the, the, the tendency uh, um, to want to enjoy uh, sensual uh, pleasures uh, is still there. Uh, for example, if a person uh, uh, practices like nowadays, they practice vipassana meditation, uh, they don't want to practice samatha, so they, they know the Dhamma to the extent uh, that they are bodily and mentally withdrawn from sensual uh, pleasures. Uh. But because the sensual desire, the hindrance of sensual desire is not rooted out, uh, in their dreams uh, they can still uh, uh, want to engage in, in sensual uh, pleasures. Uh. But person who has attained the jhanas uh, and uh, uh, eliminated uh, this sensual desire, then uh, he would not have the tendency uh, to um, want to engage in sensual uh, um, uh, pleasures. Uh. So he has a chance of becoming enlightened. Uh. He is like this third, third type of wood. Uh. Again, uh, we consider it from the, in terms of the factors. Uh. Uh, a person uh, who is a Sotapanna, uh, the Buddha says, uh, he he, if he has not attained uh, Sotapanna, does not need to, to attain uh, the four jhanas. Uh, Sotapanna and Sakadagami, the first and second fruition area, uh, they have eliminated three, three factors. The, the, the second fruition Sakadagami uh, eliminated three, sorry, three uh, factors and uh, also weakened uh, uh, greed, hatred and delusion. So, uh, it is only the Anagami who has... Uh, destroyed uh, the factor of uh, ill will and sensual desire. Uh, so uh, a person uh, who to, to be able to become an anagamin, uh, you've got to have four jhanas. Uh, so when a person has uh, perfect samadhi, uh, four jhanas, uh, then uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, s uh, this sensual desire uh, is uh, abandoned. So sometimes, uh, that's why in the suttas, uh, the Buddha says, uh, if you were to slander even an external sect, a sectic, uh, who has uh, gotten rid of uh, sensual desire, that means he has attained the jhanas, uh, your uh, coming offense is very great. Uh, so, so you can see from here, uh, if a person uh, has not uh, attained the jhanas, uh, there is no hope. Uh, it's just like the... Uh, a uh, sappy piece of wood. Then the Buddha continued, I thought, suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrain and crush mine with mine. So with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrain and crush mine with mine. While I did so, sweat ran from my armpits. Just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down, constrain him and crush him, so too with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrain and crush mine with mine, and sweat ran from my armpits. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and Uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I stop here for a moment. So here you see, the Buddha was trying to use his mind to crush his mind. What does this mean? Because a person like the Buddha, he wants to become enlightened. And then when he analyzes, he knows it is this consciousness, this awareness, this mind that creates all the pain. As long as we are aware, as long as the mind is working, we are aware of pain, we are aware of suffering. But if this mind were to stop working, then we are not aware of any pain. 
uh, where there's no more suffering uh, when the mind just uh, stops lah. Uh. So he's uh, because he didn't know the Dhamma, he used the strength of his mind uh, to crush his mind. Uh. So here you can see here uh, that the Buddha did not succeed uh. But I think there are some external sect ascetics uh, who managed to succeed. Uh. So what happens when they crush the mind with mind uh, and the consciousness ceases? Uh, uh, then they become unconscious. Uh. That's why there's a class of beings uh, called Asanya Sattā. Asanya Sattā are supposed to be a class of beings in the fourth, fourth jhana heaven. And they are just a, a blob of a body uh, with no mind. They are not conscious at all. Uh, they have no perception, no consciousness, no feeling. Uh, so probably uh, they are this type of ascetics uh, who use mind to crush mind. Uh, and they succeeded. So when they were reborn, uh, the mind stopped working. But they've been there for a very long time. Uh, I don't know how many world cycles uh, and after that, uh, uh, when they have used up their, their time, uh, suddenly the, the mind starts working and they fall out from there. Uh, so, But because they have not become an Arya, they still be in the round of rebirths, uh, up and down. Uh. So here is uh, interesting uh, how the Buddha tried to, 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 one of the ways to get out of samsara, but did not succeed. I thought, suppose I practice the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose. While I did so, there was a loud sound of winds coming out from my ear holes. Just as there is a loud sound when the smith's bellows are blown. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my nose and, and, and ears, and, and nose, nose and mouth, while I stopped the in-breaths through my nose and mouth, there was a loud sound of winds coming through my ear holes. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such fe painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. Stop here for a moment again. You see these two cases, uh, the Buddha used so much effort uh, and uh, the body was in great pain. Uh, but you notice here, uh, uh, his uh, tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established because his concentration was so good uh, the mindfulness uh, did not slip uh, and uh, and even the painful feeling that arose uh, extreme pain uh, did not manage to invade his mind and remain because his mind was so strong uh, that happens with, with somebody like the Buddha who has attained the Arupas, Arupa Jhanas. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths to my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, violent winds cut through my head, just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp sword. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths to my mouth, nose and ears, violent winds cut through my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and re remain. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, there were violent pains in my head. Just as if a strong man were tightening a tough leather strap around my head as a headband. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, there were violent pains in my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, violent winds carved up my belly, just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an, an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, violent winds carved up my belly. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathless meditation. 
So I stopped the in breaths and out breaths to my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, there was a violent burning in my body. It was as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals. So too, while I stopped the in breaths and out breaths to my mouth, nose and ears, there was a violent burning in my body. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So you see, huh, this uh, uh, the Buddha's uh, 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 efforts, huh, such great efforts, huh, and uh, a person without a strong mind, uh, without jhana, could not possibly uh, practice what the Buddha practiced. Lah, because uh, the, the pains were going through all his body, uh, and yet he could stand it uh, because his mind was so strong. Now when deity saw me, some said, the recluse Gautama is dead. Other deity said, the recluse Gautama is not dead, he is dying. And other deity said, the recluse Gautama is not dead nor dying. He is an arahant, for such is the way arahants abide. I thought, suppose I practice entirely cutting off food. Then deities came to me and said, Good sir, do not practice entirely cutting off food. If you do so, we shall infuse heavenly food into the pores of your skin, and you will live on that. I considered, if I claim to be completely fasting while these deities infuse heavenly food into the pores of my skin, and I live on that, then I shall be lying. So I dismissed those deities, saying, there is no need. You see here, even the deities uh, pity him so much. Uh, I thought, suppose I take very little food, a handful each time, whether of bean soup or lentil soup or veg soup or pea soup. So I took very little food, a handful each time, whether of bean soup or lentil soup or veg soup or pea soup. While I did so, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. Because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jotted segments of vine stems or bamboo stems. Because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof. Sung in. Because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. Because of eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank far down in their sockets, looking like the gleam of water that has sunk far down in a deep well. Because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered, as a green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. Thus, if I touch my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. And if I touch my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Entirely no stomach at all. Because of eating so little, if I urinated or defecated, I fell over on my face there. It's so weak. Nah? Because of eating so little, if I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots fell from my body as I rubbed. Now when people saw me, some said, the recluse Gotama is black. Other people said, the recluse Gotama is not black, he is brown. Other people said, the recluse Gotama is neither black nor brown, he is golden skin. So much had the clear, bright color of my skin deteriorated through eating so little. I thought, whatever recluses or Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, there is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, there is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins at present experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, for there is none beyond this. But by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Could there be another path to enlightenment? I considered. I recall when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, jambu tree, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. Could that be the path to enlightenment? Then following on that, on that memory came the realization, that is the path to enlightenment. I thought, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? 
I thought, I am not afraid of the pleasure, since it has, it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. I stop here for a moment. Uh. So after a lot of ascetic practices, uh, the Buddha almost died. Uh. And after that, uh, he thought very hard, uh, what is the path to enlightenment? Uh. Then he remembered when he was a small boy, uh, he could enter the first jhana. Uh, then following on that memory, uh, he realized uh, that is the path to enlightenment. Then he recalled, why didn't he use this uh, uh, jhana before? Uh, then he recalled, uh, because he thought uh, that uh, that jhanic pleasure uh, uh, is uh, blamable uh, because it is enjoyment. Uh, because a lot of ascetics say uh, the, the way to enlightenment uh, is not through enjoyment but through suffering. Uh, so that's why he gave up the, the, the jhanas. Uh, but now he realized uh, that the jhanic bliss uh, is different from sensual pleasures, completely different. Uh, uh, it's nothing to do with un, with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. Uh. Uh, jhanic bliss, uh, jhanic pleasure uh, is a very wholesome state. Uh. I considered it is not easy to attain that pleasure with the body so excessively emaciated. Suppose I ate some solid food, some ball, rice and bread, and I ate some solid food, some ball, rice and bread. By that time, five monks were waiting upon me, thinking, if our recluse Gautama achieves some higher state, he will inform us. But when I ate the ball, rice and bread, the five monks were disgusted and left me, thinking, the recluse Gotama now lives luxuriously. He has given up his striving and reverted to luxury. Stop it for a moment. Now, these five monks uh, were his disciples uh, and they were all striving together. But when the Buddha decided to take the middle path, uh, they looked down on him and left him. Now when I had eaten solid food, and regain my strength, then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. But such pleasant feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh, this is very important. Uh, the pleasant feeling that arises in meditation uh, does not invade the mind and remain. Uh, there's a sutta, I think, Majima Nikaya Sutta 43, where one Arahan said uh, that uh, worldly pleasures, when we engage in worldly pleasures, uh, there is a tendency to crave for it. There's a natural tendency to crave for it. Just like a child, uh, after eating ice cream or chocolate, uh, there's a tendency to crave for it. Uh. But with jhanic bliss, uh, the mind in jhana is so strong, so strong, it's in complete control of itself. So uh, even when pleasant feelings arise, uh, it does not uh, invade the mind and remain. Uh, there is no tendency uh, to lust uh, for this uh, jhanic uh, bliss uh, that is stated in the Majjhimana Kikaya Sutta 43. Uh. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, then in the third jhana, fourth jhana. But such pleasant feeling that arose in me did not invade, invade my mind and remain. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. Stop it for a moment. Now. So you see here, before the Buddha could recollect his past lives, he had to attain the four jhanas. After attaining the four jhanas, the Buddha says, the mind is concentrated, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, attained to imperturbability, uh, in the right state uh, to use. Uh, and then he recollected his many four past lives. Uh. This was his first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Uh. Then after that, uh, he attained the second knowledge, uh, uh, the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings, uh, which we, we read earlier. Uh, this was the second knowledge. And then the third knowledge he attained uh, was the understanding the Four Noble Truths la, and uh, the uh, Asavas, la, destruction of the Asavas. La. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the pain of sensual desire, being and ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Agivesana, mm. I recall teaching the, the Dhamma to an assembly of many hundreds. Perhaps each person thinks the recluse Gotama is teaching the Dhamma especially for me. But it should not be so regarded. The Tathagata teaches the Dhamma to others only to give them knowledge. 
When the talk is finished, Agivesana, then I steady my mind internally, quieten it, bring it to singleness, and concentrate it on that same sign of concentration as before, in which I constantly abide. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha, when he is not in meditation, then he teaches the Dhamma. But when he is not teaching the Dhamma to others, then he is constantly in the jhanas, the same sign of concentration, concentrating on that same sign of concentration as before, in which I constantly abide. Arahants always abide in the jhanas. And then... This man said, this can be believed of Master Gotama, since he is Arahant, Samasam Buddha. But does Master Gotama recall sleeping during the day? The Buddha said, I recall at Agivesana in the last month of the hot season. On returning from my arms round after my meal, I lay out my outer robe folded in four and lying down on my right side. I fall asleep mindful and fully aware. I stop here for a moment. Arahants are supposed to have sati, mindfulness or recollection, 24 hours a day. Their mind is so strong, even when they fall asleep, their mind is mindful. The body is rest is resting, the mind is resting, but their mindfulness does not stop 24 hours a day. And this Sachaka said, Some recluses and Brahmins call that abiding in delusion, Master Gotama. And the Buddha said, It is not in such a way that one is deluded or undeluded, Agivesana. As to how one is deluded or undeluded, listen and attend closely, closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, Sachaka, the Dinganta son, replied. The Blessed One said, Him I call deluded, Agivesana, who has not abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. For it is with the non-abandoning of the taints that one is deluded. He might call undeluded who has abandoned the taints that defile, bring the renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. For it is with the abandoning of the taints that one is undeluded. The Tathagata Agivesana has abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm tree whose crown is cut off is incapable of further growth, so too the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. When this was said, Sachaka the Niganta son said, It is wonderful, Master Gotama. It is marvelous. How when Master Gotama is spoken to offensively again and again, assailed by discourteous courses of speech, the color of his skin brightens and the color of his face clears, as is to be, as is to be expected of one who is Arahant Samasam Buddha. I recall Master Gotama engaging Purana Kasapa in debate. And then he prevaricated, let the talk aside, and showed anger, hate, and bitterness. But when Master Gotama is spoken to offensively again and again, assaulted by discourteous causes of speech, the color of his skin brightens and the color of his face clears, as to be expected of one who is Arahan and Samasam Buddha. I recall Master Gotama engaging Makali Gosala the same way Ajita Kesa Kambalin, Bakuda Kachayana, Sanjaya Balati Putta, Niganta Nataputta in debate, and then they prevaricated, led the talk aside and showed anger, hate and bitterness. But when Master Gotama is spoken to offensively again and again, assailed by discourteous causes of speech, the color of his skin brightens and the color of his face clears, as to be expected of one who is Arahan Samasam Buddha. And now, Master Gotama, we depart. We are busy and have much to do. Now is the time, Agavesana, to do as you think fit. Then Sachaka, the Diganta son, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, got up from his seat and departed. Uh, that's the end of the Sutta. So this last part, uh, when this uh, Sachaka, because he's such a great debater, uh, when he corners these external ascetics, uh, they can't answer him properly. Uh, they get angry. <laughs> But uh, when he, he knows uh, that uh, he's, he's speaking to the Buddha uh, offensively again and again, uh, using discourteous courses of speech, uh, but each time uh, he uses offensive speech, uh, instead of getting angry, uh, the Buddha rises up to his challenge, uh, the, the, the face brightens uh, uh, and uh, skin brightens. Uh, uh, so the Buddha never gets angry. Uh, so he's very... Uh, uh, impressed uh, by the Buddha.
So this is quite a long sutta. Uh, so the Buddha here uh, describes uh, all the painful practices he went through. Uh, stop breathing uh, uh, is extremely painful. Uh, all the, the, the pain in the head, pain in the body and all that. Uh, but he could withstand it because the mind was so strong. Uh. So here you see uh, the Buddha says in this sutta, uh, worth noting uh, is that uh, for a person uh, to hope to become enlightened, uh, is not, he must not only be withdrawn from sensual pleasures uh, bodily and mentally, uh, even uh, the uh, the tendency uh, uh, must be fully abandoned and uh, suppressed internally, uh, uh, even uh, deep inside. Uh, there is no more uh, desire for sensual pleasures, uh, otherwise uh, there is no hope for enlightenment. And this uh, you can only do uh, when you get rid of the hindrance of uh, sensual desire. Uh, so, okay, we stop here. We're nearly one and a half hours. Okay, anything to discuss? Thank you. the Sakata asked the name how the blessed one is explained to the disciple. Isn't it more relevant for them to study the Vinaya rules? Vinaya rules, uh, as we saw yesterday, uh, is uh, the uh, bottom part of the training. Uh, remember, we we, we we read the suttas, uh, how among us, uh, when he becomes a monk, uh, the very bottom uh, is getting fame, getting fame. And then uh, the Buddha says, uh, the monk should not be content with that. Uh. After that, he should practice sila. Sila is the Vinaya rules. Uh, uh. And uh, after that, the Buddha says, I should not be, be content with that. Uh. Then after that, uh, he, should, uh, he should go further. And after... Uh, then uh, he should get concentration. Uh, then after concentration, then he should get the knowledges, uh, knowledge and vision. Uh, knowledge and vision, uh, the different Aryan stages. Uh, uh. So, Vinaya uh, is a tool, uh, a tool. But to become enlightened, uh, uh, the Dhamma is more important. Dhamma is more important than Vinaya. Mm. So that's why uh, the Buddha uh, always mentions uh, Dhamma Vinaya. Dhamma first and then Vinaya. Uh, also, in the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, you find uh, uh, perfect sila uh, consists of three factors. And these three factors are right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And these three factors, uh, if you look into it, uh, uh, right speech, there are four precepts. Uh, right action, there are three precepts. Right livelihood is covered by right speech and right action. Uh, so actually, uh, the sila component, uh, moral conduct in the Noble Eightfold Path uh, consists of seven precepts. But in the monks Vinaya, there are 227 precepts. Uh, a lot of it... Uh, is uh, only to give the Sangha a good image. Uh, a lot of these precepts, uh, if a monk breaks the precepts, uh, he does not do moral, uh, uh, um, um, he's not, uh, he's not uh, doing some karmic offense. Uh. For example, uh, in fact, some of the rules, uh, of these 227, uh, uh, the first person who broke it, uh, sometimes were Arahans. You know? For example, uh, once, uh, an Arahan, uh, he came to a certain town. He was traveling a long distance. Uh, so he came to a certain town, and he wanted to look for a place to stay. And I guess during the, the, those times, uh, they had these rest houses, uh, rest houses. And the person in charge, the manager of the rest house was a woman. Uh, and this Arahan, uh, I'm not sure whether it was Anuruddha, uh, happened to be a very handsome Arahan. So, and also the rest house uh, happened to be... Uh, Full. So he came in the evening uh, and he wanted a place to stay. So the manager found that all the rooms are full. Uh, so the manager told him, uh, 
uh, all the rooms are taken up lah. But if you don't mind, uh, you can take my room lah. Uh, then he's then uh, being an arahan lah, uh, he uh, doesn't have any. Uh, uh, his mind is very straightforward. Uh, I don't know any room will do lah. So he agreed lah. So he went to live in that room. But in the middle of the night, this woman came to tempt him lah. Uh, took off the clothes and everything. But because he was an arahan, he was not moved. He didn't do anything. And then after that, the woman apologized to him. Uh, and then after that, the next morning he left. When he went back to the, monas to the monastery, uh, he, he told other monks what happened. And then the other monks uh, informed the Buddha. And the Buddha called him up. And then in front of everybody, uh, made this rule. Uh, any monk, when he stays anywhere, uh, you, you, you cannot stay in a place where there is a woman. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is one of the rules. Uh, the first uh, was spoken by a monk. Another one was, there was one uh, ascetic Arahana. Uh, he lived high up in the hills. Uh, and then uh, when he goes on arms down, uh, he has to walk a very long distance, uh, uh, several kilometers uh, uh, to the village uh, for arms food. So after he gets his arm food, uh, he walks a long distance back to the hill, uh, the top of the hill. So he stays there. And because it takes so long to walk up and down, uh, he thought uh, uh, the food that he has taken, uh, he will keep overnight. Uh, and it could last him three or four days. Uh. So three or four days once, uh, he will come on arms round. Uh. Uh, so the, after eating the, 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 the food the first day, uh, uh, the next day he will dry it in the sun. Uh. So it becomes dry, eh? it can still uh, eat eh, for another few more days. Eh? Uh, so when the Buddha heard about it, the Buddha said, no, now you cannot store your food overnight. Every day you have to come and, and, and beg for your food. Eh? So it, there's nothing wrong, <laughs> actually morally wrong, eh, with keeping the food overnight, right? Uh, but the Buddha wanted the, the monks eh, maybe to, you know, firstly, uh, to, to give a chance for lay people eh, to to merit. Secondly, he doesn't want monks uh, to, to store food uh, once you are in the habit of keeping food uh, and uh, always want to store food overnight. Uh. He wants the monks uh, to be free of all these things. Uh. Once you store food, uh, there's something to tie you down. But you don't store anything, you don't keep anything. Uh. Anytime you can travel anywhere, like the Buddha says, like a bird. Uh, just it needs a pair of wings and uh, it can fly anywhere. So. A uh, monk's uh, property, uh, just a set of three robes and arms bowl. He can go everywhere he wants. Uh, and that's the problem with China. The, the emperor didn't have the wisdom of the Buddha. He forced the monks to be vegetarians. Uh, after that, the monks could not travel like a, like a, like a bird, uh, going anywhere and beg for food. <laughs> Clip their wings. Uh, they had to stay put in the monastery and, uh, and cook their own food and do chanting to get money and all this thing. So actually in the Buddha's discipline, uh, taking a particular type of food, uh, choosy about food, uh, is an impediment in the holy life. That's why the Buddha disallowed monks uh, to, to, to become vegetarians. Devadatta asked the Buddha to make this rule uh, so that monks uh, must become vegetarians. The Buddha said no. Uh, the Buddha said uh, as long as we eat meat, uh, which is pure in three respects, uh, you don't see, you don't hear, you don't suspect that he was purposely killed for you, then you take it uh, with no uh, no coming offense. Uh, and uh, that is very suitable for a monk. Uh, then a monk can go anywhere, live anywhere. Because basically a monk has to live in lonely places. The Buddha wants the monks to live in lonely places, like he himself. Uh, and uh, if you do that, uh, you cannot be choosy about your food. Okay, that's uh, lots of merit. Huh?